All right, everyone, welcome to the final perspective of the four perspectives we've been handling. We handle the historical, uh, biblical perspective first, then the historical perspective of the world Christian movement. Then last week we took care of the historical, cultural perspective. Maybe we should start over. Anyhow, <laughs> the cultural perspective, and today we'll handle the final perspective of the strategic perspective on the world Christian movement. Uh, by the way, uh, as a somewhat of a bonus, but I don't know if it's a bonus because I really like the quizzes, but for this perspective, there'll be no quiz. Okay, so just enjoy the ride. Just enjoy the ride, all right? But don't let that deter you from uh, keeping up the intensity of, you know, our studies together, okay? So here we go. Come on in, it's okay, come on in. We have a new star. <laughs> Come this way. Sir. Okay. Her name is Eddie. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Eddie, we're on page twenty-six. Okay. So here we go. Uh, mission training for the, the strategic perspective. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you will not believe, even if you were told. Habakkuk 1.5 Now, in this passage, uh, the specific context has to do with God calling down judgment, actually, on Jerusalem. That, indeed, the Babylonians are going to come and raise the city and raise the, the temple and so on and so forth. But I really do believe that it has the living and active prophetic power where this also has to do with our generation that God's going to do amazing things uh, in our time that we would not believe even if we were told uh, the Lord said in other passages that we will do greater things than these we'll do greater things than even he did and we can really just have a lot of hope in that have a lot of faith in that and really be encouraged to live out our our kingdom identity with boldness and authority um, so, yeah, we need to be prayed up and be led in the presence of the Holy Spirit, but I don't think strategy is outside the work of the Holy Spirit. I think strategy is well within the work of the Holy Spirit, well within the wisdom that God gives us that we can skillfully navigate kingdom victory in our context, okay? So this, we're going to look at the strategic perspective. So again, I'm not saying that uh, strategy is the answer for missions. Of course it's not. No method and no program is going to do the kingdom work of changing the heart of people and renewing their mind. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. But, there, but the Spirit uses different means to manifest His presence. And without a doubt, again, wise and skillful ways, wise and skillful strategy is not outside the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit. God's promise to bless all the families of the earth first given to Abraham 4,000 years ago is becoming a reality at a pace you would not believe. Although some may dispute some of the details, the overall trend is indisputable. Biblical faith is growing and spreading to the ends of the earth as never before in history. So we see this chart, believers as a percentage of total, total world population in the 20th century. And you can see even just from the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century, 1900, look at the scale by which Christianity has grown in these latter years, closer to the year 2000. Truly exponentially, like straight up on that curve. So it took 18 centuries, looking at that ca caption, it took 18 centuries for dedicated believers to grow from 0% of the world's population to 2.5 in 1900. 2.5% of the world's population were believers in 1900. Only 70 years to grow them from, their, from that 2.5% to 5% in 1970, the double, and just in the last 30 years to grow from 5% to 11.2% of the world's population. Now for the first time in history, there's one believer for every nine uh, people worldwide who aren't believers. Now, this information, this data is a little outdated. We're at 2012 now. So that scale is even higher, or that curve is even higher, and the percentages are going fast, going up or rising faster than even what we've seen, or even what we see on this chart. 
Really, in our day, in our time, we have been uh, we have been given the privilege of being born in a time of the history of mankind, the history of the kingdom, where we see the quickening of the coming of the Lord, the quickening of the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven, faster, broader, wider, all those things than ever before in all of the history of mankind. This is our privilege. This is our honor. This is our inheritance. This is our responsibility that we may be good stewards of what, what has been entrusted to us. Frankly, if I can share a little bit of a testimony, I think I shared this a little bit before, but this is why Jubilee was birthed the way it was. When I came here, uh, I came here in 2001. The reason why I came to Korea was because, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm the oldest of five boys and brother number four. You know, you know what he does. My brother's name is Tim. He's a singer here in Korea. And he's been doing that kind of work for the past, uh, you know, 10 years that he's been here as well, 11 years that he's been here. And when he first came here, he came with my brother number three, his name is Danny, he's getting married, and that's where, why, where I'm going to go, why I'm going to the States this Monday to officiate his wedding. Anyhow, uh, they came out here, uh, and my parents sent both of them out here for camaraderie's sake, but also Danny, well, he's also very talented, probably, perhaps arguably the most talented musically in our family, right? So maybe he was also into drama and theater, and therefore maybe there were opportunities for him as he's with my brother Tim. But when Tim get, came out here, they scouted him to be a, a kasu, a singer. And one thing led to another where things worked out for him, right? But when they came out here, my parents were like, Dave, you know, your brothers are so young, they could barely pay their phone bill on time, they still can. <laughs> 11 years later, but anyway, sorry, is this being recorded? No. You know, they could barely pay their phone bill on time, let alone take care of their faith in the music industry in Korea, away from their parents. Like, this is like the worst combination of things that we can imagine. We can't go, Dave, but you can go. So you go and be a big brother to them. And I was like, what? Go to Korea? What is a Korea? Even though I think we Korean, I am not Korean. Korea was never on my mind, as probably is true with most of us who are not from Korea. I was like, no, I ain't going. No way. And at that time, I was going to seminary, Southern, uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, the oldest Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in the States. Uh, the main campus is in Louisville, Kentucky. And... We had an extension program in Philadelphia. I was studying there because I was able to serve at my dad's church. And my grandmother was who raised me when I was a when I was a baby up until like you know five years. I actually all my life. My parents left when I was one years old to the states so my dad could study at seminary. So my grandmother raised me until I was five, and then I moved to the states with my grandmother. Okay. So I, you know, under that, that from that point on, I was with my parents. But my grandmother still raised me. You know, and that's it's true with a lot of us or a lot of immigrants anyway. So you know. Uh, you know, I was like, so I was in Philadelphia, you know, serving my, at my dad's church. I was so happy and proud that I could you know, stand in that uh, kingdom lineage and heritage of my father and, you know, and all that stuff. And I was now planning to go to the, the main campus in Louisville, Kentucky. And I was like, no way, I'm not going to the Korea. What am I going to do there? I'm going to seminary right now. They're like, you can go to seminary in Korea. I'm like, you know, my Korean is really bad now, but it was even worse then. And I was like, there's no way I can study in Korea. It's like theological studies, there's no way, whatever. I said some other words that probably shouldn't be repeated right now in my mind at least. And, uh, and I said, no, I'm not going. So my brothers left for Korea. They were gone four, three, four, five months before I actually ended up coming. But what happened was during that time, I had everything moved so I can, and posture so I can go to the main campus. Like my dorm fees are paid, like I was right there. When all of a sudden my dad heard of some, uh, some school, now called Torch Trinity Graduate University, but just or most recently they changed their name, but it was called Torch Trinity, what's it called? Graduate I forgot, School. Graduate School of Theology. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot already. Um, anyway, uh, so they're like, man, this school teaches everything in English, you can do, you know, you had your issues, your issue with seminary or theological studies in Korea, but now you can study in English in Korea. I was like, no, like, what is a torch? Like, I don't want to, what is this stupid school? Da, 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 da. You know, but now I'm like number one advocate, right? But, you know, I looked it up and basically I just saw that there was, you know, just a, a strong academic heritage because they were working with Trinity Evangelical Divinity School out uh, in Chicago or Deerfield, Illinois, which is a good school. And, I mean, there's a whole other history that I don't want to get into about Torch, but yeah, because it, it's changed since then, but for the better. But uh, anyway, at that time, it was that had, they had that kind of affiliation, so it really, I was like, man, that means like, I can be in Korea, make my parents happy by being with my brothers, which wasn't reasonable reason enough before. <laughs> but then on top of that, now I can build my relationship with my brothers, come to think of it, because, you know, my brothers are, my, my second brother is two years younger than me, and my third brother is six years, and then Timmy is seven years. 
So we're not that far apart. My youngest one's 14 years. That's quite a gap. But uh, for my brothers three and four, we're not that apart now. But when I was in high school and graduating, I think they were still in elementary school. So that's, that is quite a gap. So I was more like Uncle Dave to them rather than a brother. So then I could build my brother, you know, finally build my relationship with my brothers and really just be a brother to them. And then on top of that, I could be in Korea, learn, finish my education in English, and on top of that, I'm ethnically Korean. I could learn my language and my culture. And, you know, wow, not that that's happened very much, very well, because I've been in Korea, but everything I've done is in English, family, school, church. So I could understand why my parents didn't. I used to have a complaint towards my parents and my parents' generation, why they were in America and they didn't learn English, didn't learn American, you know? <laughs> but now I have total sympathy, you know? I realized why. I did the same thing. I came here and spoke in English everywhere I went. I never picked up Korean. So I, have, uh, I repented and I have a lot more compassion. So anyways, uh, uh, in fact, I have a lot more. I'm so proud of them because what I did is nothing compared to what immigrants have done going to the States and plowing the ground there, plowing, plowing the ground there to make a life for a lot of us who lived abroad, you know, whether it be the States or Canada or some other country. So anyway, um, so I was like, wow, this stuff that money couldn't buy, even if I tried to set it up this way, yay, and I was, I was really just, my heart was moving, when all of a sudden God gave me another word, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind is conceived, well, God has mind for those who love him, call the word, but go, yeah, oh, God has stored for those who love Him, right? So when I heard that, that word was burning on my heart, and I was always thinking about that word, so I re received it as a promise. Lord, even the things that I can see are so great. Imagine how much more you have planned for me that I can't see. Like, hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! -er. Like, like more joyful. And I came really with the joy of the Lord to Korea. Uh, but my plan was two years in Korea, finish my education, and go out, because I had finished already a year and a half of seminary at Southern, right? At their extension program. Um, but in those two years, God really changed my heart. When I was in my former ministry, uh, I was there for five years before I came in and here. That ministry was called JSEM, Chayir Sundar English Ministry. The reason why I went to that church was because my father was a pastor in training there, or a chandosa, met my mom there, dated and got married there. And the same senior pastor was there until, I think he's just getting ready to retire now. So when I saw my family uh, history there, I wanted to kind of honor my father and mother and, and, and step into those shoes again. And uh, since then, they've had two pastors, uh, both friends of mine, Sam Eepin and now Christian Lee, and they changed their name to New Philadelphia Church. So New Philly is where the, the English ministry is where I started that, and now it's grown to something beyond what I, frankly, could have done. Christians doing such a great job over there. Anyhow, um, so uh, while I was there, my two years there, the Lord showed me two things really vividly. Uh, number one, uh, he showed me how much he loves his church, how much he loves his people. Now, the church is, of course, all the people of God, but at the end of the day, if we know that our faith is to love people, we're not omnipresent. We're not everywhere like God is. If we want to love people, you got to be together with them and be together with them regularly and often. That becomes a, a local congregation. So that means it's a local church. So that means the power of God is in the church, but in the local church. And the Lord said, I will build my church. The gates of Hades cannot stand against it. The power of it is the local church. And I had major issues with the local church. Even as I was going to, I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to be a passionate Christian. Why do I have to be a pastor when I felt my calling? And that's another story for another day, but that was a big tension because I'm a pastor's kid. And then I was like, okay, fine, I'll go to seminary, but I'll just be a professor and keep an arm's distance away from the local church because I had local church issues. Because I just saw the... The commitment that it takes and the pains of it, I saw it in my father and mother, and I just don't want to be a part of it for a lot of other reasons as well. But this is another long story, but God broke that down on me when he showed me how much he loved this church. And I said, all right, Lord, oh my gosh, you love your church. It's the power of God here on earth that the kingdom, you know, that the kings of Hades cannot stand against. So I want to be a lover of your church. It started coming out of my mouth. I want to be a builder of your church. I want to be a man of your church. I want to build your church, Lord. And then as I was, that was turning my heart, I, you know, my, as I was at JSCM, and especially here in Korea, I started going out to the mission fields. That, you know, all over the, you know, not all over, but like, I've been to Cambodia a bunch of times, like at least 10. I can't, I gotta count all my little visas, you know. Uh, Philippines, many times over as well. Uh, you know, India, Uzbekistan, and I, as I'm traveling, I'm just seeing how the nations, I'm seeing what the Lord is saying about the nations, that He loves the nations, every tribe, every people, every tongue, every, every nation. And when I started seeing that, my heart started to burn for the nations to be harvested. And I said, Lord, you love the nations. 
I want to love the nations too. I want to take nations for you. Let's build your church. I took those together. Build a church to all nations. Yay, you know? And once those two pieces started really stirring in my heart and I started praying that, my eyes popped open for the country that I want to leave two years, you know, from the time I got in. I was like, to Korea. But now I'm like, oh, Korea, look at it. It's different than what I thought. All of a sudden, I started seeing Korea differently in these ways. My gosh, first of all, geographically, can it be any more strategic? We're going to talk about the 1040 window, but right now, it's right here to th these fields. That we're, right, we're right here. We're right in front of the fields that need to be harvested. Like, you can come from the States, and it's great. We need people to help. If they go on an eight-day mission trip, then here's a problem. You know, six of those days they're jet lagged, and you know, and uh, it costs like five thousand dollars now. You know, I mean, like my goodness. But we we can send people to China two hours, an hour and a half flight, to send thirty people. You know? I mean, it's so it's right there. And you know, when we went to Beijing, right? Uh, 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 at that time, John Rowe was there. I don't think he's there now, right? Or maybe he is there right now. Anyway, I mean, a friend of ours, a contact guy, he was trying to tell us like subways are like this and like. Food is like, we're like walking ahead of like, No worries, dude. Because like, we already know the Asian context. It's different, obviously, from Korea, but because we're familiar with the way Asia moves, we got there. We were like, we didn't need no intercultural studies that much. I mean, we did, of course, because Chinese people are different. But there was a flow. I mean, there, so anyway, there was, there's that strategy. Not to mention the fact that financially, Korea has been so provided for, man. It's like now, like a war-torn country 50 years ago, but now in the G whatever, is it like ninth in the world? It's in the G20, but like the ninth largest economy in the world. Are you kidding me? It's the star, shining star example of development. You know, according to the eyes of the world, like how did Korea become like this? Where it was a receiving country, now it's a giving country. There's no other country like it, actually. But I know why it's like this, because God, He provided. He provided for Korea, that it can be sustainable, that it can be a sending resource for His kingdom work. Not to mention, spiritually speaking, I saw, you know, a church cannot grow without the presence of God. Korean church has this issues, there's no doubt about it. The Bible says, don't be surprised, the wheat and the weeds will grow together. So you know it's all together, but there's no doubt that a church cannot grow without the presence of God. Clearly the Korean church has grown. 500 years from now in the future, if, if the Lord hasn't come back, it'll go down in history that there's another great awakening. And it was in Asia, it was in Pyongyang. And there's, you know what I'm trying to say? There's a significant movement of the, of the body of Christ here where the whole world has taken note and recognized that something has happened in Korea. Something's happening, happening in Korea. Not the way the Korean pride flag, but that's just the fact of the matter. I don't know what else to say. So we see the movement of God, we see the presence of God. You know, not to, and then on top of that, English, everyone's speaking English, and Korea is the most English-crazed country in the world. Teachers are coming in and out, and I see God unifying people this way, because as it was 2,000 years ago, why did the gospel spread so quickly to, to so many different peoples? Because of Greek, everyone spoke Greek then. And the Romans, under their role, rule, they built the Roman infrastructure, the roads, you know, so that when the gospel was preached, it could go crazy fast to many different peoples. And we have that situation in much increased measure today. We have the language of English all over the world, and we have the infrastructure, planes, trains, automobiles, the internet, and teachers to carry it as well, you know, to literally link the whole world for the kingdom. And when I started seeing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I said, look, I felt the Lord saying, David, do you know why I'm showing you these things? I said, yes, Lord, you know, my citizenship is not with the U.S., but it's with you in heaven. It's in the kingdom of God. So until you call me home, if you want my bones to be buried in my motherland, I could think of worse things. So, Lord, I commit my life to Korea. So two years in, I committed my life to Korea. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if I was going to do well, I didn't know what I was going to do. But I committed my life to Korea. And one thing led to another. This is another long story. I'm not going to get into it. But God gave me a vision for Jubilee Church and blah, 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 blah. And here we are today. But the ethos, the centerpiece, one of the pillars of why Jubilee Church exists today is because of this very chart. There is a quickening of the kingdom of heaven in our day, in our time that we've never seen before. And we want to be good stewards of it. Right? Strategically, right? From Korea. Our mission is from God, to make disciples of all nations. But our vision is specific to, I pray, our church. Not, well, not specific to our church. I think other churches have this calling as well. But our, that's our calling, our vision, is to be an English-speaking hub for missions from South Korea. Voila. Because it has strategy behind it. Because there's a time, this is a time, where the increased coming of the kingdom is very visible. 
and we need to be a part of it. Okay? Can we get an amen? Yeah. All right. And that, that's not just for Jubilee Church. You know, I don't mind saying amen for Jubilee Church too because God's doing a good thing here. But I'm talking about just what God's doing around the world and our calling to it. Whether we're here or not. Okay, so we shouldn't really be surprised to see the thrilling advances of the gospel all over the world. That is exactly what Jesus said would take place. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all nations. And then the end shall come. Matthew 24, 14. However, while this amazing progress of the gospel gives much cause for rejoicing, it obscures a tragic reality that there are still billions of people that have yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The kingdom task is not finished. Thus, a close look at the end of Matthew 24, not 14, right? 24, 14 says a lot about what we should watch and work for at the end of the age. Jesus says that as the missionary task is completed, there will be a witness to all nations. By witness, Jesus was saying that the gospel of the kingdom will be established in open view throughout entire human communities. The gospel of the kingdom is prevailing over evil, liberating people so that they can live obediently under His mastery and blessing. God wants a persuasive display of the kingdom victory exhibited in every people. What better exhibit then of God's kingdom uh, is there than a community of people who are living under Christ's kingship? That's why we should and must aim at church planting movements, discipleship within there as well, in every people. While not the only way to glorify God, nothing puts Christ's Lordship on display like a community of people dedicated to following Him. So, you know, as a share, because if you want to put love on display, because Christ is about love, we need people coming together who have no business coming together if it wasn't for Jesus, loving each other. Okay? And patience, through perseverance, in the depths of relationship, in the depths of sharing each other's burdens, tested over time, that's the church. That's the church. It's the power of God. And uh, we believe it here. Discipleship and establishing communities of faith. Church planting, in a sense. is the key for is the key strategy. The Lord would agree. You are the light of the world. The city and the hill cannot be hidden. hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, this rock of faith in Jesus Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, will not stand against it, in other translations. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, Ephesians 3.10. Awesome stuff! So the overarching strategy, as we go into this strategic perspective, is about building the community of God. Okay, that's, that's the overarching strategy that we're going to really focus in on, is building the community of God, discipleship, church planting, etc. Okay? Now to do this, to help us through, we need some handles, some strategy, right? Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about from here on through. There's four different approaches, according to, you know, there's different ways that people look at it, different uh, ways that practitioners and missiologists group people and stuff like that. This is one way. But according to this one way, there are four different approaches to people group thinking. Number one, ready? Blocks of people. B L O C S. B L O C S, no K. Blocks of people. And that is defined as a limited number of summary categories into which we can place peoples in order to analyze them. So they're big blocks, as you can see Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists tribal people, etc, etc, etc. Okay? Then the second group is called the ethno-linguistic people. Ethno-linguistic. Ethnos-linguistic people. And uh, this is defined as an ethnic group distinguished by itself, uh, by its self-identity with traditions of common descent, history, customs, and language. Okay? So, you can categorize Americans would be an ethno-linguistic people. It's, a, it's still a broad category. I like to switch actually four and three, if you if you don't mind. I will go to four first. Unimax people. Unimax people. Unimax people is defined as the maximum U N I M A X people. The maximum sized group sufficiently unified 
to be the largest people movement to Christ. We're unified at first to the fact that there are no significant barriers of either understanding or acceptance to stop the spread of the gospel. Um, this, this, we're going to see it in a, in a chart later, but you can also understand it this way. UMS people is a maximum size group sufficiently unified to be reached by a single indigenous church planting movement. So, any group that can come together as one church, is that would be a Unimax people. Okay? Where one church can minister to them. Where there's not such differences where you have to do crazy weird things, or different things. But it's one group, okay? And then, number three is socio people. It's a relatively small association of peers who have an affinity for one another based on shared interest, activity, or occupation. So this would kind of be the mission of life. Taxi cab drivers, teachers, students, people in government, you know, these are called socio people. But they're not necessarily Unimax people. You know what I mean? Like you could be working together as a lawyer, but you have all these different peoples from different blocks of people, ethno-linguistic backgrounds, and therefore we're not one Unimax people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. It's okay. Uh, it takes a, these concepts take a little time to digest. But again, um, yeah, you can have again a group of socio people. Let me say a bunch of teachers. Let's say you went to an international teacher fair. And there are a bunch of teachers there. You're all one teachers, one group of teachers. We have teachers from Myanmar, we have teachers from China, you have teachers from the States, from Africa, etc., etc. Therefore, though you are the same socio people, you are not a Unimax people because you can't, you, you, everyone is so from so many different backgrounds that you couldn't really congregate them into one congregation and minister to all of them the same way where they would all similarly understand what you're talking about. You know what I'm trying to say? Okay, anyway, think it through, think it through, all right? or meditate on that a little bit more. Um, so to move on, the first two of these four is useful for summarizing the tool for total task and developing strategies and, strategies and partnerships and known people. They're big, big groups and big strategy um, defining categories. The latter two are more useful for those who are on the field working to establish churches. Only the last one, or number four, only the Unimax people allows us to speak of closure to the essential missionary task in the sense that every person has a reasonable opportunity to respond to the gospel. So, Unimax people is really important because it, as we talked about, church planting is the most important word. Creating communities of faith is the ultimate strategy. So Unimax, it's, it's basically saying that Unimax people group reach out, outreach and the attempt or the strategy to find and build the Unimax groups is very important because that's how you really establish churches. Okay? All right? You guys with me? All right. Next page. Check it out. Political boundaries. Nigeria and surrounding countries. But does that help us with strategy? Not necessarily, because if you look at the ethno-linguistic map, look at that, the same area. It's like, wow! Like, what's going on here? Like, there, trust me, there's not one strategy to reach Nigeria. You need... 147 strategies. You know, like, look at all those little ethno-linguistic people blocks or people, uh, groups. And from here, we got to understand it more strategically to find the Unimax people groups. And even within there, the socio people groups. And use those as groupings, strategic groupings, so that we can address all the different peoples of the world. Okay? Next page. The four approach to people group thinking. This will help you a little bit more composition, what defines a group, how they're identified, strategic significance, and quantity, okay? So you can just look, kind of look that over. But I guess a couple things that I want to just point out is that how they're identified, their blocks and ethno-linguistic peoples are, uh, you know, you can find that data published in different places, but the only way you can find socio-people groups and even mass peoples are if you actually go there and you're there, you discover it on the site. Okay, uh, and another thing I want to point out is the strategic significance. 
Blogs help you get a global overview. Ethno people, ethno linguistic peoples help us to mobilize and to find some more specific strategy. Unimax people help you to do church plants. Where socio peoples help you do small group evangelism. Okay? Yes? Which part? Okay, okay. If you look on the chart, are you with me on page 29? Okay, if you look on the chart, how they're identified. And in fact, all these things are good. What what you know defines their group? Blocks mean religious cultural spheres, ethno-linguistic, linguistic, ethnic, political boundaries, you know, Unimax people's cultural distinctives or prejudices, and socio-people activities or interests, and then how they're identified as mentioned in strategic significance. So this is all giving us handles on how to understand people, how to group people, so how we can address the different needs of the people, that we can really share the gospel with them effectively. The next chart, or the next diagram, the great imbalance. Uh, you have the reached and the unreached. You have people groups 14,000 reached and 10,000 unreached. You have non-Christians, 50% in even the reached people groups and unreached as well, 50%. But check this out. The Protestant missionaries, this is where I kind of want to focus on. The 75, 74% of people, of, of missionaries, are actually in the reached people groups already. People that are considered reached. Where only 26% of missionaries are in the unreached people groups. That's the, great, that's the whole gist of this. The great imbalance. Three times as many missionaries to reached peoples than unreached peoples. It's kind of sad, right? Next page, the globe at a glance. You can re read this over. I'm a little bit, sorry, I'm not a little bit, but <laughs> the, the print after we copied it over and over again, <laughs> you can't really see it all that well. You can read some things, but here's the gist of it, ready? The darkest part, the darkest colors, that is true Christians in those different categories. Okay? The, and everything outside of that, from the lighter color to the white, are non-Christians, either not, the colored parts that are not the darkest, that means they're non-Christians, but in reached places. That's how you would interpret it. Where the white, you know, categories identify or represent non-Christians in unreached places. So if you look at this diagram, you see all the dark the dark part of the pie chart in towards the middle of the circle, right? That's all the true Christians in the world. Everyone outside of that are either nominal or unreached, in a reached or unreached area. So visually we can see the globe at a glance in terms of who is saved and who is not. There's a lot of work to be done. Just because it's a reached nation doesn't necessarily mean that everyone there is Christian, right? So there's, if you include them with the unreached, man, there's a lot of work to be done. And you can see that there. Okay, let's move on to page 31. We are in the final era of missions. Or at least we are able to see for the first time in history the end of the tunnel. Where there will be a church movement within the language and social structure of every people group on earth. Powerful face-to-face -face evangelism taking, uh, taking over in all places. We can actually see it. We can actually chart it. For the first time in history, uh, you know, we, we're either in the final era, or at the very least, we're able to see the ends of the earth and start charting it. God is moving throughout His global body to fulfill His promise to the nation, uh, to the nations in ways that we could not possibly have imagined just even 20 years ago. Thousands of new missionary recruits are no, are no longer coming out of, from the West, but also from Asia, Africa, Latin America, fruits of missionary movements, wholeheartedly embracing the Great Commission. You know, as you guys know, we've been in Korea, the number two sending country in the world after the United States. But if you do per capita, it might be, it is number one. And if you do ratio, popular, uh, population ratio, Korea is number one. And actually, I heard a report just even a few years back that Korea actually had surpassed the number of missionaries missionaries that America has is sending. It might have dropped down over the years again, but it's right there. 
So in other words, man, there's crazy things. God is moving all over the world, right? Especially in the church of the, of the, of the South, which means non-European, not North America. South, Afri South America, Africa, and Asia. Uh, more so than ever before, it is a global cooperative movement. We have, uh, we have to be prepared for new partnerships, new insights, and new approaches by non-Western mission structures. At the same time, we need to recognize that the Western missionary story is a reservoir of mission experience that can serve the emerging missions. The job is large but relatively small for the enormous body of believers around the world. There are approximately 670 churches in the world for every remaining Unimax people group. So we need only a small percentage of dedicated believers to actually to be mobilized and equipped to actually reach them, to reach everyone. Notice how much more doable the mission task seems when we focus on the size of the potential mission force and on penetrating people groups instead of talking of evangelizing 20 billion plus individuals. We can talk of beginning in approximately 3,000 ethno-linguistic peoples and then finishing in maybe as uh, in maybe as few as 10,000 Unimax peoples. So within a very short time, all of the 3,000 least evangelized ethno-linguistic groups will be targeted and engaged by some mission-sending structure in the world. It is already true for more than half of them. So basically, when you have these strategic categories, it makes the task all the more handleable. If you say, we need to reach 2 billion people, you're like, oh no. But if you break it down, hey, no, there's 3,000 least evangelized groups and about 10,000 Unimax people groups. But if you, if we have, you know, all the churches in the world, if we just work together, 670 churches can just focus on one Unimax people group, we'll reach everybody. So in such, even if 670 churches don't cooperate, we need just a few dedicated people to really do this. We can strategically actually accomplish the mission. That's what we're trying to say here. So identifying and penetrating the remaining unreached Unimax people Peoples, the great challenge of discipling all the nations, still lies before us. God will reveal the glory of His kingdom among the peoples. But we are within range of finishing the task with more momentum than ever before in history. Amen. Okay? So let's focus in now. In terms of some of the more specific... Well, it's still pretty broad. We'll get more specific later. But still, we're focusing in, in, in some of the strategy. Covering the globe. Looking at Isaiah chapter 54, 3. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dis uh, dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Uh, Patrick Johnstone sees three major challenges we face if we are to complete the task of world evangelization. Okay? First one is the geographic challenge. That's an obvious one. There's a lot of land to cover here in this world, on this earth. The promise is that God's people will spread abroad to the right and the left, or we could equally say to the north and the south, the east and the west. Every inhabitable, inhabited part of our world must be exposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a geographical challenge. There are tough challenges, but for missionaries to reach them, here's the fire up me part, which I pray will fire you up. No, val no valley is too isolated. Like the remote, unevangelized kingdom of Mustang, on Nepal's northern border. No island too distant like the unreached Maldives islands in the Indian Ocean. No forest too dense like the Congo jungles where the Pygmy people live. No mountain too inaccessible like the remote and harsh Tibetan plateau of Central Asia. No city is too fortified like Mecca where no Christian is allowed to set foot and no desert is too hostile like the Sahara, Sa 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 like the Sahara oasis in Algeria where the uh, Mizad Berber people live. So, as we believe and the anointing and the authority and the boldness that God has given us through the Holy Spirit, uh, we do have ge geographical challenges. There's no doubt about that. But as was stated uh, in this article as well, we took it from this article, uh, I pray that we will be motivated with kingdom authority and kingdom vision and kingdom joy to really say an amen to all that was just read. Seriously. No city. No, uh, too fortified. Even Mecca. God's already breaking in there. You know that, right? I mean, it came through ugly ways through the war in the Middle East and all that kind of stuff. But man, the God's in there. And you hear stories as people go out from, whether it be YWAM or different church missions, and people meeting these remote, uh, going to these remote places. I just heard of a sister who was in Nepal. They had to like just backpack and there was no even trail. They had to just cut through the bush to two hours to this village. And they started sharing, she started sharing the gospel. And, and uh, 
I was so blessed personally that she like didn't, she didn't know what to preach, so she remembered one of the sermons that she heard here, talked about the Samaritan woman, talked about the Samaritan woman and why Jesus asked her all those questions. And the reason why he asked her all those questions was not to condemn her, but to show her, hey, I know everything about you, but I still love you. And she preached that word. And then she asked her sisters to come forward. And these women are weeping and crying. And she's laying hands and praying. And they're coming to Jesus Christ. You're like, whoa, seriously. No jungle to them. I'm telling you. The kingdom of God is coming. But we've got to understand that there is a geographical challenge. But we've, got to, that we've been called to overcome. Um, so check it out. If you look at this diagram, the resistant belt in the 1040 window. This is the 1040 window, guys. Everyone's heard about it, I hope. But this is what we see, bordered by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and the 10 and 40 degree latitude, latitudinal lines. That's what is called the 1040 window. 90% of the poorest, most illiterate people in the world live here. The most child abuse in the world is here. The most diseases in the world is here. Six billion people or so in the world and in this place, like we have 1.5 billion who have never heard of Jesus, right? Or 1.5 of the people in the world, 1.5 billion people in the world, there are 1.5 billion people in the world who have never heard of Jesus, and 95% of them are in the 1040 window, is what I wanted to say. And there are about 1.5 billion people in the world who have never heard, or something even say 2 billion people in the world who have never heard of Jesus Christ, but 95% of them are in this 1040 window. What's up, dude? Oh my goodness. You think you came here by accident, people? You think you came here by accident on a, on a I started to call you out camera on a Fulbright's grant or just to teach English or whatever it is? Come on, by military or you think no way, no way. God is assembling his people, a vast and exceedingly great army, for a time such as this, for a place such as this. And we need, to, we need to be wise. We need to be full of the power and presence of God, but we need to be wise and strategic in how we, how we handle this. Number two, top page 33. As we've already discussed, there's the people challenge. And this is another example. The, the, the diagram that you see here is another look by another author of how different groups of people are grouped together major affinity, they call them affinity blocks in the 1040 window. Uh, so through research, people can be studied to be better, uh, to better understand their diversity and to formulate strategies and missions. For example, Johnstone uses the concept in terms of affinity block and people clusters to address the challenge of people group, grouping and uh, yeah, refer to the four different approaches to people group thinking section as another example. You'll see there's articles about that, right? So the basic point here is just like we read you know, blocks of people, ethno-linguistic people, socio groups, Unimax people. This is another way to look at it, and we see all these different things. We need, there's a people challenge here. Uh, the following are some, page 34, the following are some strategies to address the people challenge. Number one, church planting. Do you want to ad address the people challenge? We need church planting. You need, number two, scriptural translation. You need to use other literature, Bible tracts, books, you know, etc. You need audio ministries. This is a little outdated. Uh, I think we just say media. But anyway, audio ministries, but this one should be identified. Jesus Films. Wow. Jay? Jesus Films? Dude, it's amazing what God has done with the Jesus film. Basically, they just put Jesus... The, the movie of Jesus, like the Passion, but without being so graphic, right, and over the top. And they just translate it into many different languages. And they just put it, they show it in the village, and people come to Christ like crazy. Through the Jesus film. Radio is huge. R, radio. Satellite communication, cell phones, internet. So this is some strategies to address people's challenges, okay? Church planting, scriptural translation, literature, audio ministries, Jesus films, too. Jesus films and videos, radio and satellite communication. So there, there are different groups that handle some of these pushes exclusively, like Wycliffe Bible translators, right? We have people who do, just do Jesus film. We have a lot of people who are passionate about radio. Uh, like for instance, 
one of uh, one of uh, uh, one of our seniors in faith who come through our community from time to time to bless us, and and uh, we work together with him as well is Pastor Robert O. He does work in Cambodia with his wife Jenny O, who's going to in Cambodia. You, you'll get to know them. And a major part of how he does things is uh, not necessarily church planting. He does it through literature. He publishes books and and like you know publishes a lot of books and he does radio. He's trying to like coordinate radio where the gospel can be preached to radio. And you have Far East Broad Broadcasting Company. You guys, do you guys know FEBC? Far, Far East Broadcasting Company started by Pastor Billy Kim uh, out of Suwon Central Baptist Church. It's huge. It's powerful. The kind of work they do, gospel work they do through this, through this uh, media to address the people challenge. Okay? Uh, number three, the urban challenge. Please note that 50%, again, a little bit dated information, but probably more now, 50% or more of the world's population live in cities. So the great cities of the world are the key challenge for mission in the 21st century. We ignore cities to our peril. The great cities of our world are the source of, our, of most of our wealth and, and misery, wisdom and depravity, innovations and sin. The engine for societal change is in the cities, but if we use wisely, it can be the dynamo for the growth of the kingdom. Our desolate cities are an immense challenge, but Johnstone believes that a new day for urban ministry is dawning. For the Lord promises us that these cities will be populated with His people. So, if I could take it one step further, this urban challenge, I would call this also the mission of life. This is where the mission of life would fit. Because in the city, you have people living in the urban context, doing urban work, which includes you know, everything from education to government, to arts and media and entertainment, uh, to medicine, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the urban challenge. This is how I would perceive or interpret it. And I think it would be pretty accurate to do that. So. The world's needs, world needs. Now we see these challenges, let's look at some of the needs of the world. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we, uh, when do we see you sick or in prison and go to, or go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for, the, for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Matthew 25, 37 to 40. Guys, Jesus and the poor are inseparable. Uh, the needy flocked around him everywhere he went. The beggars, the blind, the lame, the destitute, with no other place to go, the hungry. And he was touched by their infirmities. Ten times in the New Testament, the New Testament records that Jesus was moved with compassion. Uh, each time in the context of Jesus' personal confrontation with suffering people. When Jesus was moved with compassion, every time, each time it was in, in the context of when Jesus personally confronted the suffering of the people. So check out some of these things, you know, statistics. Very big picture drawing statistics, but, you know, I hope it'll draw a picture or remind us of the needs of the world right now. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. For nearly two out of every three people alive today, hunger is not merely an occasional pang felt before lunchtime, it is a lifestyle. Can we just sit on that for a moment? Think about that. You know when you feel hungry? For us, it's just a matter of annoyance. I don't know about you, but you know, it's true. Hungry people become angry people. I mean, I make a joke about it, so let's hurry up and move on with this so we can all eat together. Yeah, yeah, we celebrate that. By God's grace, we can. But the reality of it is that two out of every three people in the world, hunger is not a joke. Hunger is a reality. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. And water is the most precious of all resources, a vital necessity of life. A human being cannot live without live more than a few days without it, yet, as you know, it composes 90% of our blood, 80% of our brain, 75% of our flesh, 25% of your bones. Isn't it amazing, but God's brilliance, by the way, that water makes us up that But yet, going back to what we're talking about, yet 1.1 billion people in the world lack access to clean water. It's tragic. I was a stranger, and you invited me in every 
content in hardware statements of homeless victims of war, intolerance, and social unrest. I was naked and clothed me. In addition to man-made disasters, forcing refugees to flee, other violent events leave thousands of people homeless and in need of disaster relief and, and assistance. You know, from the hurricanes to the earthquakes. I was sick and you cared for me. Malaria, tu tuberculosis, and parasitic infections invade and destroy millions every year. Many treatable, preventable diseases take hold among the poor and often those sicknesses lead to death. Something as simple as dysentery, it, 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 seriously, it can kill you, but it, it, it's very treatable, very treatable. All these things are so treatable, some of them are obviously more serious, but nonetheless there are very treatable things that really just, in, other, in some of these places, just equal death. I was in prison and you came for me. More Christians are persecuted and martyred for their faith in this century than all previous centuries combined. Do you guys know this? Nearly two-thirds of all Christians alive in the world today suffer persecution in varying degrees, including loss of freedom, discrimination, imprisonment, slavery, and torture. I just saw a report, I think it was on CNN, that was, they were saying that there is a global war, a silent war on Christianity rising up in the Middle East. Especially like in Egypt, they're killing Christians. I think there's like a war against Christians. There's a, like, you know, when the Bible starts saying that you'll be persecuted for your faith, the times are here, the times are coming. More so in this century than any other century before. So what can we do? What can we do? Do you guys see the needs of the world? What can we do? Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And together, we can change the world. One side of the service. we got to do our part. Korea just 50 some years ago, someone saw the need of orphan, war-torn kids. War-torn orphan kids. And guess what happened? Compassion International started. Likewise, World Vision also started in Korea. They saw a need and addressed it. They done their life, sacrificed, and now blessed them to be what it is today. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And together we can change the world, and I believe in that. The offering of the five loaves and two fish, giving everything you have, even though it may be so minuscule in light of the needs of the world, God will take the blessed to feed the masses. That's His promise to us. And I pray that we'll believe this. Okay? Okay, we're almost done. These last few pages will sit through pretty quickly. Uh, the spontaneous multiplication of churches. Remember, the overarching strategy that we're really trying to address is discipleship and church planting, community building, right? So church planters can avoid unnecessary hardships and struggles looking for principles concerning church reproduction by looking into the Bible for direction. Churches are enabled to re reproduce uh, when New Testament discipling principles are applied. Go figure. Do what God asks you to do, and it works. Biblical principles themselves, if, if applied with culturally relevant methods, should enable churches to reproduce wherever there is plenty of good soil. And theologically speaking, good soil for the gospel seed to take root in and multiply is bad people and lots of men. <laughs> you know, it's by the grace of God. We don't have to be perfect. And they don't have to be like all somehow ready and willing to be good soil. And God meets us just as we are. So it gives us a lot of hope. So the simplicity of the principle disappoints some educators. They expect something more sophisticated, at least new or expensive. Missionary or not, one can multiply disciples doing these four simple things. Basic framework of discipleship to build community. This is good stuff for us, whether we're on the field or not. Ready? Here we go. Know and love. Voila. No one loves the people you disciple. No one loves the people in your life. We must know and love the people before we can disciple them, right? When Jesus told his, his disciples to look at the fields, they were finding it hard to love the Samaritans around them. They could not see them receiving God's grace. So here's some tips, right? Live in your area of responsibility to one people or community. Let the church be of the people, ownership and empowerment. This is what you will do to reproduce disciples among people. Okay, so that's some little helpful hints that you can walk through yourself. But the whole gist of it is to know and love the people you disciple. Make the effort, take the time, plan it out strategically, intentionally to know and love the people that are in your life. Next one. As you start to get to know them and love them, mobilize your, the, your disciples immediately to edify those that they are discipling. Okay? Mobilize your disciples immediately to edify those they are discipling. 
to build up the church as a living, reproducing body, Paul instructs pastors and teachers to train the members of, uh, of the church ministry to edify the body of Christ. So build edifying relationships with your leaders, uh, your disciple, uh, on the job training. So it all happens together. As you know and love, what you, what you don't want to do, if I were to summarize this, is wait to send them. Immediately start mobilizing them. Immediately sh uh, tell them that our life is a servant to give. Our immediately start showing them that, that uh, our life is about going. Immediately sh start showing them that they're, in, they're able to be a blessing to build somebody up. Immediately start doing this together. Okay? Encourage edifying teaching relationships between leaders and their disciples. That even in their relationship even in your discipling relationship that those who are being quote-unquote disciples also have an encouraging and edifying effect on the, on the leaders themselves as well. And empower them. Don't let them be like, listen, I'm the expert and you are the you know, young grasshopper and you will always learn from me. No. Show them that edification, the blessing of God moves simultaneously and like together. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So immediately empower the people to know to let them know that they are empowered by the, by the Spirit of God to be a blessing right where they are. Mobilize and edify, right? Number three. Teach and practice obedience to Jesus' commands and love. There's another important aspect of discipleship towards church planting movements. Above and before all else, Jesus, after affirming his deity and total authority on earth, commissioned his disciples to make disciples who obey all his commands. So his commands take priority over all other institutional rules, but disobedience is always in love for God and others. So, blah, blah, blah. I mean, blah, blah. That's what we see here. Start uh, right out with love and obedience to Jesus' basic commands. And I mean, it's listed right there, just as a general outline. You know, part of the discipleship. Repent, believe, change your mind, be baptized. Love God and neighbors in a practical way. Celebrate communion together. Pray, give, disciple others. I mean, these are the basic components, big picture components of what it is to obey the Lord. Uh, you know, define evangelism and theological uh, education objectives in terms of obedience, right? That we don't evangelize just as a method or understand theology and study perspectives just to know, but it's a matter of obedience. It's about knowledge on fire. That this stuff will help you know God more, love Him more, and know and love others more. So always, it goes together. Orient your teaching to loving obedience. All of it. Okay, there you go. Build loving, edifying accountability. Number four, A, accountability. Same thing similar to edifying, there's got to be accountability. And accountability means really allowing, um, if I could just find it real quick, I would say having that posture of humility and having the posture of learning that you allow people to speak into your life. And it's not what you think and feel that's a priority, it's what others think and feel and see about you to actually take priority in your life. You know what I mean? Where you really trust what they see, that you allow them to have authority in your life to hold you accountable, to let them in that way, and vice versa. Okay? So, what we see now are some diagrams we're going to fly through, but they're fun to see. Uh, this is Diagrams that compare good versus bad discipleship and church planting. You know, when the above principles are executed and being lived out or not. So when they're not really being lived out, you have this pastor or passive pastor-centered church. Okay? A weak pastor dominates his church. But when you have it going right, look, 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 what's ha look what happens. Page 37, interaction in a dynamic church. When you have the principles of discipleship working, a strong pastor promotes ties between all members. Boom, 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 and it networks out. That's what, that's what you want to see. You know, of course, we want an anointed pastor, you know, in a sense, but more, like, not more though, but alongside of the anointed pastor, we want the anointed people. Because the people are the anointed pastors as well. That's what we want to see. Similar to church, the same way. You have a mother church controlling all that's around. 
I hate to say it, but that's kind of like everything from Catholic churches to denominational churches. You know? My little quick commentary. Not to say everything is wrong with the Catholic church and denominational churches, but you kind of say, see this kind of model. But what you should see happen when you have proper discipleship going on is this. Boom, 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 boom. Networking and empowering and partnerships and this dynamic growth that look like, honestly, a living cell. That looks like a living tree branching out all over the place. Fine, it has a root in the mother church, but man, by the end, by the end, you can't, you, you may not even be able to make that connection from the fruit to the root. Because look at some of these churches, they're like, they look different. They're in huts and, you know what I'm trying to say? Alright. Uh, this was an important, this is an important thing that I want you to read and you'll see. Uh, uh, if you have an opportunity to read the Pioneer Church Planting, there's some stories of all that stuff. It's a good, it's a good source of uh, material, but I didn't, we didn't have time to go over it, but refer to it there. And then number four, World Christian Partnerships. Another strategic aspect. Here we go. There needs to, uh, today, the world, you have to be a world Christian. There's no other way. We have no other choice. Everything is connected, you know? So a world Christian is one whose life direction, L, has been solid, solid, uh, I'm sorry, solidly transformed by a world vision. Okay? There are three steps to becoming a world Christian. Number one, catch the world vision. See the cause the way God sees it. See the full scope of the mission of God. The mission, catch the Catch the world vision. And then keep it. Keep the world vision. Put the cause in your heart and uh, in the heart of your life in Christ. And then put your life in the heart of the mission. Right? And then lastly, obey. Obey the world vision. Develop a strategy that makes a lasting impact on the cause. Especially to reach the unreached. So like this will make a moment. If you just catch the vision, it's just that place of faith in conviction. You're just convicted. But there's nothing else that happens as a result. We want just, we don't want just a moment, but we want a momentum to flow out of this. So you want that momentum to flow. We catch the vision, we keep it, and we obey. Right? But the reality is that we need to be world Christians. Having caught the vision, the world Christians want to keep that vision and obey it unhesitatingly. Furthermore, uh, we as Christians must realize that this life is not a time of peace but war to make a re-consecration to a wartime lifestyle not a peacetime lifestyle the Queen Mary now, I, I shared this I think last week remember the warship half of it is a warship and half of it is was a, was a let me read it for you I bought it just it's a good it's an awesome little illustration so I'll, I'll read it I think it's this time Ralph D. Winter actually wrote it this way. Uh, the Queen Mary, lying in repose in the harbor at Long Beach, California, is a fascinating museum of the past, used both as a luxury liner in peacetime and a troop transport during the Second World War. Its present status as a museum, the length of three football fields, American football fields, affords a stunning contrast between the lifestyle appropriated peace and war. On one side of the partition, you see the dining room reconstructed to depict the peacetime table setting that was appropriate to the wealthy patrons of high culture for whom a dazzling array of knives and forks and spoons held no mysteries. On the other side of the partition, the evidence of wartime austerities are in sharp contrast. One metal tray with indentations replaces 15 plates and saucers, bunks, not doubles, but eight tiers high explain why the peacetime co complement of 3,000 gave way to 15,000 people on board that same ship in wartime. How repugnant to the peacetime masters this transformation must have been. To, <coughs> excuse me. To do it took a national emergency, of course. The survival of a nation depended on it. The essence of the Great Commission today is that the survival of many millions of people depends on its fulfillment. All right? So, I think it's a good reminder of what we shared last week about how there's a kingdom war going on. But yeah, as a world Christian, we've got to keep the globalization of the world in mind, the world in mind, but that this is also a battle of raging. That we can't be living in a peacetime environment again with the chandeliers and the, and, and the, and the sterling silver utensils, right? But we gotta really understand that, hey man, it's not about like having your double bed, but it's about 
bunks eight tiers high because it's go time. All right? Partnerships. If we are uh, trying to, this is another part of strategy. Uh, if we are trying to effective, effectively witness for Christ, which makes more sense, God's people working together to share God's, uh, which makes more sense, God's people working together to share Christ's love or God's people going their separate ways, each doing their own thing? What do you think? <laughs> Obviously, God's people working together. So partnerships, it's biblical. Scripture calls for pe uh, believers to work together in unity. Partnerships model the power of community witness. As we love one another, people will know that we're, we're the disciples of Christ. Partnerships are, frankly, the most effective ways to develop a church. Partnerships are needed because of volatile world conditions. And one person in one church can't do everything, right? Partnerships maximize overstretched resources. Same kind of idea. So partnerships are so key, theologically, biblically, but also practically. So here are some little notes of starting partnerships. Uh, starting and developing partnerships, consider the following lessons learned by Bill Taylor. So you can, all right, let me just read it through real quick. Listen before entering a partnership and be willing to learn from mistakes and try again. Partnerships uh, work best when there is a shared ownership of the project, including finances. This is actually good for just even friendships, actually. <laughs> be balanced, don't get stuck in, in by hard sell solely on, um, on comparisons of cost effectiveness. Take time to check out potential partners before signing up. Church, uh, the church partnerships have real potential, but, but, but must be entered with wisdom, humility, and a teachable spirit. Wise churches recognize that they cannot do and partner with those who can assist them. What, uh, recognize what they cannot do and partner with those who can assist them in the long range goals. So, frankly, I don't know if you guys see it that much where you are, but when you're part of an organization, even like especially for Jubilee, this is very strategic. We're always going over this. Like we're trying to figure out how to partner with different organizations and the, the, the protocol to do that. That includes practical, logistical matters to heart matters and we're always wrestling with this. But we definitely recognize that unity in the body of Christ is the call of the church, is the display of the, uh, of the very character of God, three in one, communion, right? And we really need to partner. So more and more these days in the end days, which we're in now, the end days started when Jesus Christ came by the way, but the quickening of the end days, we need to see the church unified. A huge part of the signs of the ends of the age. There's no way that it's just a matter of geography. It's about unity as well. Because if the walls of North Korea come down and the church, quote unquote, goes in completely divided, trying to stake their claim with their denomination and their organization, what kind of witness is that, man? A house divided cannot stand. But I believe that even for North Korea, as, it, it, as it's been said, God is waiting not necessarily for North Korea to be ready, but for the church to be ready. So that if we go in, we represent a unified front in love under the Lordship of Jesus Christ for His kingdom. And likewise, we see that throughout the world right now. Like, you know, there's this thing called Call to All, where like, like, like you know, where all these NGOs are coming together from YOM to IHOP to, uh, to uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, and they're all trying to start working together under one banner of the kingdom. And we see now, especially as a church in the South, South America, Africa, and Asia started picking up pace. The denominational strongholds that were kind of in the West are starting to break down. You know? I'm not saying, that, again, denominationalism is wrong because there's some good things about denominations, but the things that are negative are being broken down. There's no doubt about that. So we see this greater movement of unity. Here at Jubilee Church, a huge part of our core values is unity in the body of Christ. And the way we function here, theologically, functionally, I pray that it really reflects that. But anyway, that's another important strategic aspect of the World Christian Movement, partnerships. And with that, we wrap up. Again, I want to say that methods and strategy is not the solution. Prayer and the Holy Spirit and love is what it's about. But God is also to love Him with all our minds, to be thoughtful. He wants to pour out wisdom that's relevant to our context, to have skill relevant to our context. So it's really important that we know what's going on strategically, like the way we've studied just now, and to really understand the essential necessity of discipleship and church planting, church building. And I pray that as we take these principles and study them, we can not only apply them, again, in our outreach context, but right here at Jubilee, right here in our communities. Go through that discipleship, know and love and all that stuff and do that in your Bible study fellowships and your ministry service groups and, and start building the church that way. 
It can happen. And you'll start multiplying the disciples and strengthen the community. And, and the glory of God will be on display all, all the more. Um, so anyway, praise the Lord for that. Please remember, even though we don't have a quiz, to read the articles. There's a lot of good articles here. And uh, last but not least, you know, this is the fourth perspective. We went to the biblical, we went to the historical, we went to the cultural, now we went to the, the strategic perspectives. And as we put these four together, boom, I pray that it'll be, you know, just the combination that really, really equips us and puts that knowledge on fire. That equips us all the more to be good stewards of all that the Lord has entrusted to us. Amen? Good job, everyone.